So it's mid-morning on Monday, March the 26th, 1990, and most appropriately we're here in the Irish room of the Burns Library on the Chestnut Hill campus of Boston College. We've just come out of uh, quite an impressive weekend of uh, 16 of the top Irish American fiddlers on this campus, and one of the most venerable of those is here with us now to talk and play a few tunes, uh, Johnny McGreevy. Johnny, you were born in 1919 in Chicago. Uh, that's right. And uh, your parents were Irish. Can you tell me oh, a little yeah. about them and music? My, my mother was from, from Connemara, from Rushmuck, and my father was from uh, Bell and Robe in County Mayo. Yeah. So if your mother was from Rushmuck, was she an Irish speaker? She sp spoke Irish. When we were small, there was nothing but Irish spoken in our house. I used to understand it real fluently, but as you grow older, you don't hear it anymore, and you kind of forget it. But I could still understand it if I hear people talking. And yeah. your father, was he a, an Irish speaker then uh, as well? No, he didn't speak Irish at all. It seemed like the Mayo people didn't, didn't take it up too much, I don't think. <laughs> no, exactly. Not as certainly as much as the Ross Monk That's tradition right would have. Yeah. So really, it was when you were a young lad uh, at home with your mother, yeah. uh, which she would uh, speak Irish to you. Oh, yeah, to all my aunts and uncles and any, all our friends that come over, they always spoke Irish. And, uh, How many brothers and sisters had you, Johnny? Uh, I got uh, f uh, four brothers and two sisters, and they're all younger than me. And uh, I got one sister that's a nun since 1941, and uh, she's out in uh, in, uh, in Colorado now. You know, she's uh, she's still uh, a nun. So, do you think, uh, looking back now, that this, that your mother and her people did they find it lonely having come out to somewhere like Chicago? Well, I, I don't know, really don't know, to tell you the truth now. I wouldn't remember that much if she was. She probably could have been, you know, but uh, they wouldn't let on to us children anyway. But she had a community of friends who'd come in maybe and chat oh, yeah, the Irish yeah, to her. And yeah, that's uh, like my aunts and uncles and, and uh, some of my mother's cousins and stuff, you know. Yeah, and what about same music? way with my yeah. father too. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What about music in the house then, Johnny? Uh, did either of your parents play or sing? Uh, no, they didn't. Uh, my mother sang a little bit, but my father never played. And I was the only one out of our six children that ever took up the music, yeah. So when did you first hear it then? Can you remember when you first, uh, your first experience of traditional music? Oh, who was well, probably it? 10 or 11 years old, from, you'd hear them from the 78 records, you know. There was a, an old phonograph or gramophone in the house gramophone. then, was there? He had a gramophone in the house then, yeah. And did your father collect records? or? Uh, no. But, uh, we go out to my aunt's house on the south side, and, they, and she had some good records out there. You know, there was a record store not too far where she lived. You know, and uh, I, that's where I heard most of the darn Irish music was uh, at her house. Yeah. So when did um, when did the fiddle come into all of this? Then who put a fiddle into your hands? Well, I tell you, when when my youngest sister was born, we had a christening at our house, and there was a fellow named Pat Barrett, an accordion player. He played at the christening, and he left his accordion uh, at our house. Uh, and the next day, uh, I started to play, try to do something with it. I was trying to uh, figure out what to do, and the next thing you know, I got Maggie in the woods on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then my mother says, gee, she says, maybe you'd like to play music. What would you like to do? I says, well, I'd like to play the fiddle. And uh, so then I started to take lessons at school, and the nun was teaching me. and. Uh, so I, she was teaching me for three, four weeks, and every time I'd have a lesson, she, we'd play it over, and then she'd say, "Now you go home and practice." Well, then the next time I'd come back, then she'd say, "You know, play your uh, piece for me," and I'd start to play it, and uh, I put my own little things in there, and finally she says, "John," she says, "You know what? You're playing by ear," and uh, she says, "It's wasting your time trying to take lessons." She says, "What? Well, just keep up what you're doing." So then that's the last time I took lessons was that time, you know, and then the rest of it I learned all by ear. So she was actually teaching you music notation yeah, and, and uh, reading from and the notes and all, you know. Yeah, yeah. And later on, we talked uh, uh, when we were talking earlier about the uh, era of Captain Francis O'Neill and uh, and collections like a thousand and one. Do you uh, do you, would you use those collections then and use your knowledge of music writing and? Well, I, I never did pick up the, the the knowledge of music too good, but I did have a a copy of that music book, and uh, if I did hear a tune, I could always. For the little small knowledge I had, I could pick out a tune and from the book then, you know, I had a kind of a little basic knowledge of it, you know. But I never could sit down and open a book and start playing right with one, two, three, like a lot of people, you know. 
So it was those initial lessons then, um, and also listening to the recordings of what Coleman, Morrison, Coleman, and Morrison, and Patty Killorn, and uh, Patty Sweeney, and them people. They were all down in New York, and you know, and, and that's the only communication we had with Irish music was those '78 records. They didn't have no tape recorders or anything like that at that time, you know. Okay, we're just going to cut it there now for a minute. Well, Johnny, Chicago is certainly associated very strongly in all our minds with Captain Francis O'Neill and the dance music of Ireland and all those collections. When yeah. you were growing up, was there any feeling in Chicago of his presence, of the tradition that he had started, or had it all declined? Well, it had mostly declined by that time. So, you know, I was 19, 19 and then the 20s, uh, uh, I guess that was all kind of settled down by that time, you know, and all them great players that... Delaney and McFadden and all them guys, well, most of them guys were already passed away already, you know. And I never did get a chance to meet any of them people at all that was associated with Francis O'Neill. Yeah. And did that bunch of people, that generation of musicians, um, were they active as teachers? I mean, did, did they not leave sort of pupils or students or disciples behind them? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I doubt it. Uh, I, I doubt if they did any teaching, you know. They could have done, it could have happened, but I wouldn't know about it myself, you know. Well, you weren't actually playing very long before you started getting involved with a dance band. Would you tell yeah, us something about that? That's Pat Roach's Harp and Shamrock Orchestra. Uh, yeah, now that, that was, uh, uh, that, that, that band was composed of, uh, of uh, Jimmy Devine on the fiddle and John Gaffney on the accordion and Eleanor Kane on the piano and Pat Richardson on the drum and Joe Shannon was playing the pipes and, uh, and then Patty McGovern uh, a flute player from Cavan, he got in there, and, and then I was on there too then, at the end, you know, towards the 1934. And that's when they, we made them recordings for Decca at that time. We made two or three of them, I think, with Pat Roach's Harp and Shamrock Band on there. But you were very much the baby of the band, I think. I was the century. baby of the band. What then. age were you? I, I was only around 15 then, you know. And what kind of places were you playing in? Halls and things? Uh, well, we played at the World's Fair for a while, and then we'd play at dance halls. That's, that's all they had around at that time was dance halls. They didn't have no, uh, you didn't hear anyone too much playing at pubs or anything like that. And who would organize these dances? Uh, well, Pat Roach would get, uh, get it organized, you know. And then, uh, and then we'd be playing someplace and someone would ask us, well, how about playing at a wedding or playing at a party, a house party or something. And then we got a lot of playing done that way too, you know. So the kind of dancing that went on at these events, was it a mixture of Irish dancing and other kinds? Or? Oh yeah, it was a mixture of Irish dancing and then they'd always have a, another band, an uh, American band, you know, and then they'd go up for a while and then we'd go up for a while and then alternate all from 9 o'clock maybe when the dance would open until around 12 o'clock, until it would be closed in time. So you were playing the music for the Irish dance? We, I played for the Irish dancing. And what yeah. kind of Irish dances were you playing for? Uh, Mayo sets and Kerry sets and... Uh, and go away sets, just a, uh, that's about all he did. Then, well, then they do some old time waltzes, you know. So you'd play for the old time waltzes as well oh, as yeah, the sets? We would, yeah. yeah, yeah. And was there any uh, particular set which was more popular than others? Or did you find, for example, that people who had come from different parts of Ireland had different style sets? Oh, yeah, there was the Clare set too. They used to dance Clare sets. And uh, we liked them the most because uh, they were nice and short, you know. I mean, they'd. Uh, they dance and then they'd have four or five parts to it, but they'd only dance, uh, you know, not too long, and then they'd stop. Then we'd play for them, you know, and it wasn't playing a long, long time like some of the sets you'd have to play a good while before the thing was over, you know. No, I'm just wondering now, was it only the Clare people who had come out who knew the Clare sets? So what about the people from other parts of Ireland who were there? Well, they learned how to do them too, you know, yeah. From attending the same dances then? They, they oh, yeah, how to do yeah. Them. You mentioned Eleanor Kane. I'm interested in this uh, piano player in the band. Yeah. She was a terrific piano player. She was really a gifted player. Uh, she could play uh, uh, note for note, like uh, any. You could uh, you could listen to her play, and then you'd think it was Michael Coleman or Patty Killorn or James Morrison playing. She could Im imitate any of them with the uh, with all the uh, rolls and everything that she put in, and every and she didn't vamp at all. You know, it was all true playing. You know, yeah. And then she, mm. she was, uh, she married the fellow that taught me how to play. His name was Jimmy Neri, and he was from Swinford, from County Mayo. And uh, I met him in around 1931 or something like, 31 or 32. And uh, I was at a party, 
and uh, he sat down and he said, listen, fella, he said, I think you, you got the vacants of a nice uh, fiddle player. He says, and I have some nice records uh, at home. And he says, from Morrison and, and uh, Patty Clord and, uh, and Coleman. He says, and uh, we, maybe we get together and we could, I could show you how them guys are doing it and maybe you could pick it up. And he, actually, he was the one that taught me how to play. So Jimmy Neary's house then was uh, uh, somewhere you some, somewhere you visited frequently. Oh it? yeah, uh, this was before he got married. Uh, I used to him himself and his brother had a light housekeeping uh, apartment, you know, and I used to go up there maybe once or twice a week after I get through with school. You know, I'd come home from school and I'd take a run out to his house and go out there for a couple hours and uh, start picking up on the fiddle. And the next thing you know, I was uh, catching on pretty good, you know. And he was a good fiddler himself. Yeah. So would you actually listen to recordings together? Oh yeah, we'd listen to recordings and then try and play what was on there, you know, and that's how we did learn from here, you know. Would you play with the recordings when they're on, Johnny? Oh yeah, yeah, because see, one nice thing about them gramophones, you could always slow them down. And uh, they had a dial on there where you could slow it down, and if you weren't sure, you could just play it nice and slow and just pick it up, you know, dum 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 dee doo 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 you know, stuff like that. <laughs> That's amazing, yeah. Yeah. Would you play us a, a tune at this stage, maybe a piece of your own choice, whatever you'd like? Tell us a little about oh. it. And oh, okay, fine. All right. Uh, Jig Bright's favorite. It's a nice jig, that one. Yeah. Uh, last night at the concert, Johnny, here in Boston College, uh, what yeah. was the solo you played at that? Oh, uh, okay, I'll play that one for you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there was two jigs. The, the, the first jig that, that I played is one of the first ones I learned from Jimmy Neary. So I'll play the two of them that I played.
uh, what names have you got for those, uh, Johnny? Have you got uh, names for them? Well, I don't have any name uh, mm. for, for either one of them. The mm. first one I learned off of Jimmy Neri, the fellow that taught me. And the second one I, I picked that up from a great fiddler that, that uh, was down in New York. His name was Tommy Cawley. And uh, he was a great friend of Michael Coleman. And in fact, he did play a lot with Michael Coleman. And he was visiting Chicago, uh, oh, maybe about 1940, 45. And uh, I remember I heard him play in that second tune. And I kind of picked it up from him, you know. Um, Seamus Cooley is somebody you also got to know very well musically. Was he somebody you met in Jimmy Neary's house? Oh, yeah. I, uh, I remember when uh, uh, they, they tell the camp band come over to New York for a while and then uh, pretty soon uh, Seamus Cooley came up, up to Chicago and his brother Joe. Uh, Joe came here first and then Je Seamus came and also at, uh, at that time Kevin Keegan came and, uh, and they stayed in Chicago for oh, quite a, f a number of years. You know, Seamus stayed in Chicago all his life, I mean all his time until about three years ago when Joe was here about ten years and Kevin Keegan and then they went out to San Francisco and they started to teach music out there. In fact, they, they brought the Irish music to San Francisco, uh, Joe Cooley and Kevin Keegan. And you yourself have had a big impact on uh, people like Liz Carl, who was here for us for the festival as well. Do you play very often with Liz back in Chicago? Oh yeah, I played in one, uh, uh, years back there. We played quite a bit together. Yeah, we played a lot of parties and weddings and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of times we, uh, uh, after we had started Cold to School Tour here, and, we used to have uh, meetings like once a month or once every six weeks, and she was always there, and we always had a good music session before we go home after the meeting was over, you know. Johnny, you were 40 years of age before you visited Ireland for the first time. Yeah, I was, uh, uh, we went back to Ireland, we went over to Ireland with a, with a concert group of all Irish Americans. There was a bunch of uh, step dancers and two singers, and uh, four musicians, and we were all born in Chicago. And we went on a 29-day concert tour over there, and we had a terrific time. And we got a real great reception over there, too. Yeah. So did you get to hear much music when you were over there that time? Oh, God, I heard a lot of good music over there that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard a bunch of, I even heard Leo Rouse, and he was in his prime of his time at that time. And uh, in fact, we met him and everything, you know. Was this in the, what, 1950s? Uh, 1959. 1959. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So now living in Chicago, do you not feel at times, uh, say, isolated from other musicians around the country? Or well, right now it ain't too bad because there's tape recorders and all, and then you meet people and uh, write them a note or a letter or call them up, and uh, they're very obliging. They'll put on stuff on tape for you, it's the same as we do ourselves, and mail it back and forth, and then we're keeping up uh, with the new tunes and all that uh, that way, you know. Do you, do you use cassette recorders then to send stuff around yourself to friends? Oh yeah, I made quite a few tapes and we sent them around here and there, yeah. And finally, Johnny, um, because we're running out of the very little time, unfortunately, that we have, it's been great having you here in Boston for the festival. What has the meeting of all of these musicians, do you think, uh, meant to you? Or Well, I tell you, I don't think you'll ever have this group together, a group uh, as, as uh, prominent as uh, they had this week, uh, uh, together again for a good long time because you got uh, most of them, uh, uh, they're all top notch musicians, and, uh, and I think this is one of the first things that ever happened. And uh, you deserve an awful lot of credit for, well, to for think getting that us all together. To think that none of us uh, fought with each other for the time we were together. Oh, no, we? <laughs> that's right, too. And they're, and they're all, you might as well say, they're all professionals, and not one, there was not one crabby one in the crowd. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Everybody got along great, and there was all kinds of cooperation. And this, you couldn't expect anything better. Yeah, Johnny McGreevy, thank you very much. You're entirely welcome. <laughs> now, one crabby one in the crowd, Johnny. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. No, thank you. <laughs> right,